So good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, and from Gabby Eaton, my business partner and myself, Josie Walsh, a very warm welcome from Women Mean Business Network uh, to today's very special online presentation. Also a warm welcome to uh, new attendees that have uh, never been with Women Mean Business before. So just to let you know, if you want to be made aware of future online presentations or an in-person uh, get-togethers, you are welcome to subscribe for free to our newsletter called Connect and Flourish. All you have to do is go to our homepage on our website, uh, www.womenmeanbusiness.ca. Uh, when we send you uh, a link to this recording, we'll also include a link to the, uh, the website. So hopefully um, you'll keep the breast of uh, what we're up to in the next couple of months. Um, before we begin, just a few uh, housekeeping notes. If you could please keep your microphones on mute, uh, just so we don't have any background noises. And as you can see, we have an online chat room. So please do place your questions in the chat room. Uh, we will have some time for a Q&A uh, after um, our, the presentation. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce to you today our very special keynote uh, speaker. We are quite excited to have her here. Uh, Dr. Wanda Costin, Dean of the Smith School of Business at Queen's University here in Kingston. Uh, Dr. Wanda Costin became Dean of Smith School of Business in July of 2021, a collaborator at heart. She brings a combination of academic experience as well as private and public sector management. Dr. Costin is a champion of inclusiveness in business and works with community, business leaders, and university stakeholders to ensure business research and teaching is training is training emerging leaders to thrive within the changing expectations of society. No pressure there, Wanda. With a PhD, EMBA, and a Bachelor of Science, she has done research and partnered with organizations on managing diversity, inequality in organizations, women in leadership, and strategic human resources. Dr. Costin sits on the boards of the Kingston Economic Development Corporation, as well as the Business Schools Association of Canada. And it is now my great pleasure to say, Wanda, please, it's all yours. Thank you. It's always hard to listen to that. Like, who wrote that? Um, so, uh, yeah. So, first of all, I'm really delighted to be here. Good morning. It's a, The sun's trying to come out, so we're going to take that as a positive sign. Uh, and that spring really is here. Uh, so today's presentation really was uh, Gabby, Josie, and I talking about what would be impactful, how can we deal with some of the challenges everyone has, to be honest, but women in particular seem to have this in a unique and different way. I will say, feel free, I, I met with some students last night and I made them do this, feel free to keep, you know, your, your video off, I don't really care what you look like, so, you know, you could have bedhead, you could be in your PJs, I don't really care, wish I were in my yoga pants, but um, it's really hard to talk to a bunch of squares with names in it. That's all I'm going to say. So if you would do me the honor of turning your camera on so I can actually see the people, I could see like, okay, that did not land well. No one's paying attention. They are playing with a dog. This helps me. So thank you for that. For those who are comfortable doing so, I appreciate it. Today's chat is really about how do we build some resistance and acknowledging that there are challenges we all face as human beings that make this a little difficult. So because I am an off the chart uh, extrovert, I always want to know um, what are we doing? Where are we going? What are we going to talk about? Like, so, and then if I'm bad, you also know, okay, we're almost to Q and A. So that's the other way to keep track of things on how things are going. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is this thing called the inner critic. Now, most of us know that that exists. I tend to refer to it as that voice in my head and don't act like you don't have a voice in your head and I'm the only one, because we do know we all talk to each other, right? Then we're gonna talk about fear. What is fear for real? Like, what does that really mean? Because it's something that really paralyzes most of us. Um, how are we gonna grow? I, I think sometimes we forget as human beings that our bodies are evolving. And trust me, as someone who's going to be 60 this year, your body is evolving. And one of the things you realize that if our bodies don't change, we die. Literally. Like your nails grow, you got to cut your hair regularly because it's changing. And yet somehow we think it's cool to just stay where we are. It's not cool. It's actually not even comfortable. We just do that. 
And of course, lately we've had this thing called, okay, I'm going to stay where I'm at, but I'm not really going to do anything. Right. So I have some thoughts on, on that whole quiet quitting thing. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a bit about how, where we find ourselves today, the economic situation, why for some of us, it is, it is very uncomfortable. It's very nerve wracking. How do we deal with uncertainty? How do we become flexible and adapt to our current environment? And then of course, the most important part of all of this will be Q and A, right? So that's, that's how we're gonna move forward. So this inner critic, um, if your inner critic is anything like mine and mine is probably more robust because I have a lot of issues. Um, <laughs> the truth of the matter is, this is that voice in your head that constantly criticizes every single thing you do. Even when you're successful, it tries to act like, well, that only happened because, well, you were probably the only person that applied for the award or something, right? It doesn't even acknowledge the great work that you do. It's never satisfied. You could, you could run a marathon and it'd have some excuse about, oh, your time wasn't good. Just running a marathon is an accomplishment, right? Um, it draws attention to what I call perceived shortcomings. They're not really shortcomings, but they want you to feel, that inner voice wants you to feel like they're shortcomings. And the whole purpose for this is because of something crazy called perfection. We're trying to be perfect, acknowledging that we're human beings. There is no perfect human being. That individual doesn't actually exist. And so you really have to pay attention to the language. I was uh, talking to someone one time and they said this to me and I thought, oh my God, that is such a great analogy. And it actually helped me deal with this internal voice. And what they said is, and I invite you to take a moment and think about your internal voice. It may have already talked to you today because it's thinking, I can't believe you're not doing X, Y, Z and that you're on a Zoom meeting to hear this presentation. That's what it's telling you right now. See, Denise is already laughing. So that's already happened for her this morning. You're supposed to be over here doing this, 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 this. And instead, you don't take time off for yourself. Da, 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 da. Shut up. Like, just shut up. Right. That's what I say to mine. Just shut up. Right. So, but here's the cool thing. Here's how I now think about it. If that voice existed as a human being, a body outside of yourself, you wouldn't even be friends with it. You wouldn't even talk to it. You would do everything in your power to avoid it because it's so negative. And yet we let it live in our psyche. So that's how I deal with it. I go, yeah, okay, you're back again. I hear you, goodbye, right? And I just literally think about something else. But here's some of the things that I think are really important for us to remember. This is part of being human. There isn't a single human being, even people we hold in very high regard and esteem who we look up to. These people have the same inner critic. I was watching uh, some old piece. I don't even know. I guess I was channel surfing when I was traveling. And it was Melinda Gates talking to Oprah. Hello, right? These are two incredible women, incredibly successful, doing big work. They have an inner critic. They were talking about it. And I thought, okay, if Melinda Gates thinks she's not doing good enough, well, I'm fine, right? Because that means I'm not, the striving we're doing isn't going to get us anywhere. No matter how great you are, you still have that credit. So think of it as this person outside of yourself. And how, what would you say to that person? Now, you all are Canadians, so most of y'all at least. And so you're going to be very kind to it and be like, okay, I hear you. Thanks for that input. I'm going to go over here. I'm a U.S. citizen, so I'm like, shut up. I'm tired of talking to you. Goodbye, right? And I focus <laughs> on something else because that's what I would do to the person. I probably wouldn't say shut up because I've been living in Canada for five years now, but I would just walk away. I'm like, thanks for sharing. I'm out, right? So whatever little dialogue you need to do, the minute it rears its head, you got to shut that thing down. You don't have to be mean to it, but you certainly don't have to treat it like your best friend because it's not your best friend. It's not helping you out. It's actually hurting you, right? And then the other thing I do is I share actual facts because that inner critic doesn't deal in facts. And so if they say something, I say, well, that's not true because this, 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 right? 
I'm nervous before every presentation. Of course I am. I even tell my students, I was nervous every time I taught. This is normal. All that means is I want to do well and it's important to me. That makes sense. Now, if I'm afraid, that means I'm ill-prepared. So I pay very much attention to those distinctions. So if your critic raises up and says, while uh, Josie was reading that bio, uh, that's not you, you think you're all that, da 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 um, Well, that's all true. I actually did all of that. So I guess it's accurate enough, right? Or the last time you did a presentation, here's the feedback you got. So you're pretty good. It's okay. You may not be perfect. It's okay. Something's going to go wrong. It's okay. So I actually use real facts to talk to my inner critic. The other piece is you have to spend, I believe, quite a bit of time on self-awareness. I'm aware of my shortcomings. I'm aware of the areas I need to develop. I'm aware of my blind spots, but I'm also acutely aware of what I do well. So if the inner critic starts attacking there, I'm like, well, that's just not true. I know I do that well. Now you could have attacked me on this over here because I'm working on that, but who doesn't have something we're working on, right? It shouldn't belittle you. It shouldn't beat you down. It shouldn't, you shouldn't let that inner critic keep you from doing anything. So that's something I wanted to share today is how do we deal with that voice in our head? Because it often gets in my way, typically on anything that's causing me growth or a stretch or something that is I value highly that I want to do. The critic will somehow try to make me believe I'm incompetent and can't do it. And these are the mechanisms and strategies I use to get over that. So what is this thing called fear? It's real, to be honest, but a long time ago in my 20s, someone said to me, fear is false expectations appearing real. And I, that just resonated with me so deeply, I use it all the time. False, as I said with the inner critic, whatever's happening isn't true, isn't real. It isn't real. There are expectations that sometimes we have that are inappropriate, not realistic. Uh, they are things that we believe are going to happen. But if we're honest with ourselves, they never do. Like I would ask you right now to think about something you were really afraid of last week. Of course, it's only Tuesday, so this could have happened yesterday. Something you were really afraid of. And ask yourself, what were you afraid of? Like walk yourself, oh, I was afraid this was going to happen, this was going to happen, this was going to happen, this was going to happen. I guarantee you, if you're honest with yourself, none of that happened. None of it. None of it. So that was all wasted energy that could have been dedicated to actually doing whatever that was even better. We're wasting time and energy presupposing all the things that can go wrong, but they actually never really happened. Most of our fear is imagined. Now, this changes. I'm former military. So if you're out walking at night, pay attention to that gut. Because you, if, if something happens, you should turn around and leave. Because that is our senses telling us something's not right. Pay attention to that. When you're in meetings and you meet someone and, and you get some, something in your guts like, mm, something's not right with that individual, pay attention to that. Pay attention to that. Do not think everybody is out for good. They are not. So use those senses to heed that inner, you know, that piece of you, that's intuition. Honor that. Honor it. Um, my, mom, my mom used to tell me dogs were good judges of character. And so I would have friends come over and my dog would lose it. And I'm like, geez, what is wrong with you? Calm down. My mom would say, that is not a good person. I'm like, mom, seriously, Baxter just was not happy, Right. I'm here to tell you the dog was right every time. So if you can bring your dog along, this would be helpful. Um, but just make sure that you pay attention to what your intuition is telling you. But when you feel that fear, talk to yourself and walk through what is it I'm afraid of and ask yourself, what's the likelihood of that actually happening? Because oftentimes we're afraid of things that are never gonna happen. They're just not gonna happen. 
And so just go forward. And that's the whole thing. Do it anyway. In spite of the fear, do it anyway. People that we hold in high regard, people that we view are quote unquote successful, whatever that is for you, they've overcome all kinds of things. And they've done that by just moving forward anyway. Even though you're afraid, move forward anyway. So this is one of my, and you have to apologize here because my co-centric, so you could tell I did this because the circles aren't actually perfect. Of course, that also reveals that I'm a little anal. So I did not do this. Uh, anybody, I see Jess Power here. Do not tell Nancy and Amber that I did this. They will kill me. These are my marketing communications people. They would have had this looking much better. So don't tell them I did this. So this is something I came up with in my courses. And it's comfort zone, discomfort zone, and fear zone. So this is, this is like class participation time. So feel free to turn off your microphone and just shout it out. So your comfort zone is a place that we tend to operate most of the time, right? And it's called the comfort zone because we're comfortable. So when we're in the comfort zone, what kinds of things happen for us? Tell me what happens when you're in your comfort zone. What happens? Uh, possibly complacency. And why would you say that? <clears throat> because you're comfortable with it. <laughs> okay. So you're comfortable to just kind of hang there where you are, because this feels good. Yeah, I just thought I'd throw that word out there with complacency. Yes. Yeah. There's okay. more coming through. Anyone else? What happens when you're in your comfort zone? Catherine, I see you turned off your mic. Please. Yeah. You, you waste a lot of time going back to the things that really may not be that necessary, but they're comfortable. Interesting. I like that. Very yeah. good. Anyone else? For me, I kind of freeze and I go, okay, now what? What am I supposed to be doing? Ah, nice. So something inside you says, yeah, um, whatever. Let's get moving. <laughs> what do I do now? <laughs> yeah, what do I do now? I like that. Is it Sunita? I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. No, that's correct. Yeah, nothing changes. There's no growth. We're in status quo when we're in comfort zone. That's the key. Nothing mm -hmm. really happens in your comfort zone because you're comfortable, right? No change is happening. But the other, Gail, were you going to say something as well? <laughs> no? Okay. I was kind of going to maybe say the opposite that I feel peaceful when I'm in my comfort zone. That, that is good. Yes, of course. You do. <laughs> I eat too much. <laughs> my comfort of course food. You're, yes, that's the definition of comfortable, peaceful, no drama, right? This is good. I deserve to be comfortable every now and then, right? But here's what's really key no growth happens in your comfort zone. Nothing really changes. And to Gabby's point, it could lead to complacency. Yeah. And given what we've been through in recent years, many of us are like, that works for me. This is good. I need a bit of that. Well, outside your comfort zone is the discomfort zone. This is where we don't really have all the answers. In the comfort zone, you got all the answers. You've done this before, been here, done that. I got this. It actually feels pretty good, to be honest with you, because you're like, I got this, I'm rocking. You just don't realize you're rocking in an area that really is insignificant, right? You know when you get to your discomfort zone, though, because you start getting a little uneasy. You start feeling like, mm, this is not, oh, I don't, and you start questioning things like, oh, I don't know what to do, and how do I, oh my gosh, it's uncomfortable. That's your discomfort zone. But then we have this other zone called the fear zone. And the reality is we don't want to be in the fear zone. That's that whole fight or flight thing. Your whole body shuts down. You can't think well. Now, sometimes some of us are in positions that we get to control where we are in these zones. Sometimes, however, we don't get to control them. So when I used to share this with my students, I would say, just for the record, Dr. Costin, you're regularly pushing us into our, 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 our fear zone, <laughs> right? So that's not my intent. And I will admit, I've had a couple of direct reports imply that perhaps I was pushing them a little too hard. 
But I need that feedback. And the reason I need that feedback as a leader is, guess what? My zones are not equal to your zones because I've had different experiences. So something that a direct report may view as being in their fear zone, I'm like, I don't know, that. I don't say that's a big deal. Come on, what's the big deal? Well, it's because I have different experiences, right? And this is why I think experiential learning, and that's not just a term for post-secondary and K through 12, for all of us, experiential learning is critical to addressing these zones because through experiences, we actually get to change. So when we start doing things that are just slightly outside our comfort zone, guess what starts to happen? What do you think happens? As we start operating in that discomfort zone, we start doing things that we don't actually know what the outcome's gonna be. We, had, we start doing things we've somewhat never done before. They're related, but not exactly the same. What do we think happens when you start operating a bit more in your discomfort zone? What happens out there? Learning. Learning. Yes, Vicki, learning is number one. What else happens? The comfort zone gets bigger. Sorry, Gail? The comfort zone gets bigger. It grows Big. a little bit. Okay, you guys are awesome. <laughs> You're stealing my thunder. Yes, your comfort zone gets bigger. And then it pushes your discomfort zone farther. And then the next thing you know, your fear zone is like way over there. And that's how you see these people who are climbing rocks with like no gear. That's, I'm like, what has happened to you? Their fear zone is like on another planet, right? But that didn't happen overnight. It happened because they just started doing a few things out of their comfort zone. And then they got comfortable with that. So then they had to go even farther outside that to get in their discomfort zone mm -hmm. without necessarily. And your fear zone gets smaller and smaller and smaller because you get more comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's where growth happens. That's where learning happens. That's where huge success happens. But you have to have the courage to do things that you've not done before. And you don't have to go all the way out to the fear zone. You just have to take a few steps outside of where you are and test the waters. And then you can grow and do other things. So this is another way that we start dealing with insecurities, that we start dealing with that unimaginable, that imaginable, unrealistic fear. Because as you start doing more, you're also, by the way, amassing a different level of skills and competencies that are making you even more valuable and giving you a wider skill set to do, have an even greater impact in your community your work, your family. But that doesn't happen if you just stay in your comfort zone. So the key is to get outside your comfort zone and to try new things so that that begins to expand. And I invite you to pick those things that you already know you're not comfortable doing and find outlets and ways to do them. Whatever it is, figure out how to go do that, right? And it's a growing, it's a learning, it's a development. It's your own personal development. Very easy to do. So let's talk about where we are today. We're surrounded by uncertainty. The economic climate is, is just driving us crazy. We've never seen this shift this quickly in our society. And for many of us, that paralyzes us to do nothing. Like, I'm just going to stay here and let all this tornado and hurricane stuff just swirl around me. I can't, I can't deal with it. So I'm just going to stay here. The other piece that's a little freaky for those of us who are in this space is the pace of change. So it's not just that we don't know what's going to happen. It's the dynamism, the fast, the quickness with which it just keeps going. And you don't seem to have the opportunity to pause and take a breath. Because when you take a breath, something else has happened. I mean, 
We had two bank failures over a weekend in the United States, like a weekend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a little shaky, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So all those in the US FDIC up here, all those commercials around securing your deposits starting to make a little bit more sense now. <laughs> we'll pay a little bit closer attention to those now. And when your currency has no value, you can't, we can't even wrap our head around that. We're not going back to bartering. So it's a little scary. Um, we're just, many people just starting to come back to work full time. Like literally get in the building, folks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's totally fine for some of our roles and jobs to be remote. I'm grateful that we all didn't have to go, get up and go somewhere and waste gas and time and, and sit in a room that we can do it this way. So there are times where it makes much more sense and effectiveness and efficiencies to do this. But if you're in a workspace where your client or customer requires to see you, this engagement, you need to be in the office. Or if you're like me and have decided that the only way to develop a culture is face-to-face. -face. I can't develop relationships this way. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. We can maintain if we already had, but if we never had, this isn't helping, right? It's better than email. It's slightly better than the telephone, although I will say I have gone back to the phone. Um, it's, we've got to see and engage with each other, right? There's lots of opportunities for miscommunication on a screen. Mm -hmm. I've experienced it. Well, you sound like, I don't know where you got that from. That did not happen, right? Were we in the same room, right? But it, because you can't pick up the vibe, the energy that's coming off of someone. So we have to rethink even, what does it mean to be together? We're social beings. Mm -hmm. We need to be together. We've got to start thinking about this. But what I want to frame is this notion of uncertainty has always been with us. We like to think as human beings, we control our future. We do not. We do not. We just got more comfortable with thinking that the short time frame we manage is under our control. It never has been. And I think it's the pace of change that's freaking us out. Mm -hmm. But it's never been certain. So that's that reimagining again. It wasn't, it wasn't certain before, and I did fine. So I can do fine now. I ask questions of myself. What's the value of staying put? You know, I'm blessed to serve as, as the dean at Smith. What's the value of Smith staying put? Let me just tell you nothing. We'll get past faster than if, we, if you were freaking driving a Porsche or Ferrari. <laughs> we don't have the luxury of like hanging loose. Although I will tell you here at Queens, we're pretty comfortable. I got to tell you, it's, it's quite fine. It's 180 years old. We got stuff that has never changed. My favorite comment is, Oh, let me guess. Uh, we've had that policy for 180 years and it hasn't done us that maybe something has changed in 180 years. We should just keep it this way. Right, come on now. Or we've been doing it this way for 20 years. Right, in the last 20 years are just the same. They're exactly the same as they were before. You know, 2023 is just like 2003. For sure, uh-huh. Yeah, girl, I know what you mean. Come on now. It's because we're afraid and we're living in our comfort zone and we're resting on our laurels. Instead of saying, if we're gonna be and continue to have the impact this institution has had, we need to change because our students are changing, our faculty are changing and what we're being asked to do in society is changing. And if we don't change, we will become irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Now, let me be clear. I have to say this to my colleagues all the time. I don't mean we won't have students, we're freaking queens. Who doesn't want to come to Queens? Who doesn't want to come to Smith? We have an amazing education. But will we get the type of students and faculty and staff we want to have the impact this institution can have on society? That's the question. That means we got to get outside of our comfort zone, folks. That's what we got to talk about. What's to be gained from the status quo. And I ask you to ask yourself that sincerely and with 
your direct reports with people who work with you, your, if you have an advisor, ask that question and then be quiet to listen to the answer. And I think you'll wind up where I did, like that is not a luxury we have today. It just isn't. The next thing, I do this all the time. I play this game with myself, particularly with things I'm like, oh, this is not working for me. This is scary. What's the worst case scenario? To be honest, I played this game with myself when I uh, got the first job I had at McEwen as the dean in Canada, right? When I started applying and it looked like, wow, I might actually get this job. I literally was like, oh, fudge. I actually am going to leave the United States. Like, what the heck? Because it's funny, like I pursued it because I was outside my comfort zone and people said, you're a dean, so you should apply for deanships. And then of course we hired some crazy man and I'm like, it's time for me to leave the country. So I started looking outside the country. But you know what? I don't think it actually occurred to me that I might get a job and actually have to leave the country. I know that makes no sense, but that's how that person in my head operates. Oh yeah, you should go for that. You're not going to get it anyway. Okay, so you keep going and then one day you're like, oh fudge, I got the job. Now I guess I have to go, right? Didn't realize that. So I literally did, well, what's the worst thing that could happen? First of all, it's Canada. It's attached to your country. It's not that far. Number two, it's freaking cold and I don't like cold. Okay, buy a coat, you'll be fine, right? I actually had to have a heat block heater because I went to Edmonton, frozen tundra. I'd have a block heater installed. They had to order the block heater to install it before I could drive up. I was like, oh my God, what have I done, right? Little Baxter, my dog at the time had to get little booties. I bought him big old sweaters, had Canada, Maple Leaf on the back, right? We can do this. So I just played, what's the worst thing that can happen? And I decided the worst thing could happen is that I get up there and I hate it. And so what's the answer to that? What's the answer to that? I take the job, I get up there, I hate it. What's the answer? You find another job. Bingo. And I'm like, you've been able to get jobs your whole life, so I guess you'll find another one. But you gotta adjust your criteria. It has to be in warmer climates. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm still here. Barbados. So, still here, right? But you get my point. When you play worst case scenario and you answer the question, you're basically saying, okay, I can handle it. No matter what happens, I'm gonna handle it. But the positive is I'm gonna have all kinds of new experiences. I'm gonna learn all kinds of new things. I'm gonna meet new people. I get to live in a whole different country. And wow, that really outweighs the little fear I had. And even if the worst thing happens, I can handle it. So I'm going, I'm going. At the end of the day, you have to do something. You can't afford to just sit and stay where you are. Do something, no matter how minor it is, because you are setting in motion things to happen. I say regularly to people, speak what you want into the universe and the universe will conspire to give you what you ask. I actually believe that. If you start talking to people about what you want and what's important to you, you'd be shocked at how somehow that gets manifested. And it's not typically about I never said I want a job at Queens. I didn't know what Queens was. I didn't say I wanted to live in Ontario, although people in Alberta did tell me they thought I would be a better fit in Ontario. It's, I'm glad some people caught that joke. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> that was not a joke. People really said that to me. We think you belong in Ontario. I'm like, okay, whatever. Um, you have to set things in motion and it won't be what you think it is, but opportunities will come your way. And do you stay in your comfort zone, all nice, warm and cozy, or do you get into your discomfort zone and learn and grow? If I don't take the step to go to McEwen University as their business dean in Edmonton, I am not the dean at Smith today. That's the fact. And I didn't know anything about what I was getting myself into, but those are the facts. Right. So things will come your way just by operating outside your comfort zone and doing something. Some of y'all are smiling, which tells me, you know, who this is. You young people like, what the heck is that? So Google it and look it up on YouTube. So today's environment where it's so dynamic, ever changing, 
requires us to be flexible. And when I was coming up, we had this cartoon thing, it's really claymation, called Gumby. And Gumby is this little green thing and he can twist and move all, ki all kinds of ways. You can make Gumby do all kinds of things, okay? So when I hear flexible, I always think of Gumby. Like you just gotta be, you could put his, you know, although some of you who do yoga could probably put your, your ankle behind your neck. I cannot do that. So we've got to get flexible to be able to deal with whatever is coming. But I would argue even more importantly, we've got to be fluid. Water takes the form of whatever container it's in. It rushes and fills all the nooks and crannies. Going with the flow means I am one with what is happening. So instead of just being flexible, you've got to be fluid and just flow. So that you're, if you're too rigid, you break. So we've got to somehow change how we move through the world. And this is a mindset change. I spent a lot of time thinking, I actually read the book Flow. Let me just tell you, very deep, very heady. I would not recommend reading it. It is a very deep book. However, if it's on Audible, buy it and make someone talk about it because there are nuggets in there about what it means to be in the flow. This notion of going with life, setting it up together, connectedness, filling the nooks and crannies. When you're in the flow, you're in it regularly. You don't, you lose track of time. You're just so, this is awesome. How do, and this book is about how do we spend more time in the flow as opposed to fighting reality? I don't know about you, but my inner critic often is doing things like, well, that's not supposed to happen. And this is the way it should be. And da, 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 da. Well, guess what? It is what it is. This is the way it is. Deal with it. Because being over here in La La Land isn't working. How do we go with the flow? Going with the flow doesn't mean not challenging the status quo, however. Those are two different things. But how do you get in the flow of how you move through the world? Again, becoming self-aware about what's important to you. What is your value add? What are your skill sets and competencies? What experiences have you had and how are those going to help you move forward in what you want? Not what someone else would, what you want. That's important. So this is a book I read in my 30s, and it actually, uh, I actually think it's the reason I left industry and went and got my PhD. I went, I left industry in my 30s. So I was significantly older um, when I went to get my PhD. And I think it's because I read this book, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. There's nothing wrong with fear, but do it anyway. Don't let it stop you from doing what you think you want to do. Figure out how to do something, figure out how to get out of your comfort zone, figure out how to grow yourself, your business, your relationships, the impact you're gonna have on your community and society. Do it anyway, even when it's scary. You'll benefit from that for sure. So we're wrapping up. The key is that whatever you set your sights on, you can accomplish. It doesn't mean there won't be hurdles. It doesn't mean there won't be barriers. There will be. Every job I've had has had them. Um, sometimes I'm like, good Lord, what am I doing? Right? This is crazy. Right? Adjust. Be Gumby. Be fluent. Lean on others. You must create a community for yourself. I have mentors. I have peer mentors. I have mentors that are in the roles that I aspire to. I have dear friends. I spread the wealth. Like I call when I'm having an issue, I figure out who did I talk to last? Don't call that person. Call one of the other 50 million people in your social network to get help. That means you're not putting a burden too much on one person. So you should have this very robust inner circle of support. We need it. We need to lean on others. 
the Business School Association of Canada has a group of women deans. We meet bi-weekly on Zoom, all the women. It started organically. We just met once at the meeting, like we should go to dinner, girl, because I got some stuff to share. And next thing you do, we're like, oh my God, we're all having the same dang experience. Woo! So now we're like, we got to talk, right? So we literally get on Zoom and half of it is like, girl, what happened? We don't have to be deans. We're just women, right? <laughs> right? Talking about what's happening. And then we help each other. Some of us are having some very difficult times, some of which are happening to us because we're women. So we talk about it. We give each other counsel. We send each other, okay, here's how I handle that. I don't know if it'll work. What about this? What? We brainstorm. You've got to lean on each other. Your inner critic will say, oh, those people aren't caring for you, aren't looking out for you. They're not your friends. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. Reach out to your mentor. They want to help. Don't quit. Keep moving. Do something every day that adds value to you as a human being and moves you towards your desired outcomes. That is gonna matter to you because each step isn't one plus one equals two, it's one plus one equals a hundred. It's gonna really elevate and, and come back to you in a way you could not have, you could not have even imagined. Stay the course, be resilient. If you had told me when I was uh, getting my parchment on the plane at West Point on the 20th of May, 1986, that one day I would be the dean of a prestigious business school, one of the top business schools in North America, I'd have laughed at you. Because I'm like, first of all, I'm not going to have a PhD. Second of all, why would I go to Canada? So, I mean, you know, I'd had all these excuses. And yet I'm here. Just say yes, follow where you want to go, stay the course, ask for help, and do it anyway. So let's open it up for questions. I'm going to stop sharing so I can see. I can still see y'all, but I'm going to stop sharing anyway. It'll be easier for me. Okay. Think, so. May we ask just everybody to do our yeah. Yeah. And clap? That was amazing. Thank you. Hope it was insightful. So oh how my do we, oh, we have 17 people in the chat. So, okay, what do we got here? Okay, let's, uh, let's have a look here what we got. Lots of great comments. <laughs> so I, I see Catherine here. has here early on, um, how do you make time to work on things in your comfort zone, in your discomfort zone? It's not something I, I take time to do. It's saying yes to opportunities that come my way. Or if I'm engaged in some activity as a dean and I uncover like, oh, you know what? I don't really know what that means. So I will easily, um, I do Google it, I'm not gonna lie. I Google it and say, is there a document I can read? Is there a website? Is there anything out there that can help me learn this, right? And then sometimes I just reach out to people like, do you have this? Like, oh yeah, let me, here's what I recommend, right? The other thing I think that you should think about is an investment in an executive coach. So if I really get stuck on stuff, sometimes I, I book time with an executive coach who will give me feedback I really don't want to hear but need to hear. And he can tend to frame that for me in a way that's like, oh, okay, that's why that was bothering me. Thank you for that, right? But I don't actually schedule time. I just say yes to things that are not in my wheelhouse, right? Or I try something and like, I think I'm just going to do that. And often I will say, uh, I say this regularly. We're building the planes, we're flying it, folks. It's not like I've got, you know, a roadmap here, right? Um, and for many of us, when we get this job, a lot of times we think, well, I don't know what I'm doing. Well, duh, neither is anybody else. We're figuring it out, right? And if it's your first time in the role, why would you expect, this is that inner critic, why would you expect that you would know how to do something you've never done before? Like, come on. So I think you have to, this, this part is easy for you, much more difficult for you as citizens, be kind to yourself. Be as kind to yourself as you are to everybody else, right? Be kind to yourself. You should not know how to do everything. Sorry, there's no way, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any further questions here, Matt? Do you see any other ones, Wanda, that uh, 
I'm, I'm zooming through there now. Yeah, I'm zooming through it. Yeah, fears, a lot of talk about fear zone. You know, mm -hmm. it is unpredictable. You don't know when it's going to happen. Sometimes you're doing something and you think like, oh, where did that come from? Um, totally fine with that. Um, stay in our comfort zone can be okay sometimes, but it's not going to move you forward. Agreed. So, Wendy, you bring up a good point. I think what's critical is to make a decision to not just be there out of inaction, but to have decided I'm going to I'm going to stay here in this role because of X, but do so with an awareness, right? Not just hanging out because you don't know any better and don't pretend that you're doing something that you're not. Right. But feel free, you know, take your self off mute, ask a question. Mm -hmm. Share some thoughts. I think Counselor? you answered so many of the questions. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted I'm someone. Thinking. I'm not as fast as typing. Uh, but Wanda, thank you for sharing all your thoughts with us today. Um, I feel like a lot of the things that you talked about, we already know. Yeah. But do we do anything about it? Probably not. But maybe if we start hearing about it multiple mm -hmm. times, fine, it'll be like a ding. You know, how many times did you say to your kids, you know, do something, you know, you, you got to do something. You know, you can't just stay in your room and play video games, right? And, <laughs> right, Gail? <laughs> and, you know, they they just keep doing that. And then all of a sudden, something will just come. It's got to be their own idea, right? So so one day we'll wake we'll up in the middle of the night and say, I got to do something. And whether we take this idea being yours or somebody else's we've heard, you know, it'll be ours and we'll just go ahead and do something. Yeah, I think you're right. I think um, what's key is an awareness. You know, I keep going back to self-awareness and you have to, even those of us who have families and kids, responsibilities, um, I really invite folks, especially women, to say what's important to me. Too often women wait to are much older to pursue something that really is of value to us um, I tell young women all the time, because I really think they don't understand the struggle, because they just arrived and, you know, everything's fine. I'm like, yeah, talk to someone older than you and see how fun that was, right? Mm -hmm. but, and then they don't even say thank you, like they don't get it. Uh, but that's youth. They don't get it. They don't understand. It. So the key thing is, though, you can have it all. You just can't have it all at the same time. And I want women to be mindful and intentional about the decisions they make and at least have the courage to consider their needs while they're addressing everybody else's needs, because we tend to put our needs last. And it's what you said earlier. We forget when you're on a plane and we all joke about it and we all know it, but it's a point. I invite you the next time you're on a plane to actually pay attention to the safety brief, right? Because they always say, put your mask on first, because if you pass out, you actually can't help anybody. We forget that. We know it, but we don't do it. So I'm a better mom to my son because I feel better about the role I play in society. And I have shown him that no matter what, you can weather the storm. And you can do a variety of things at the same time. But if I subjugate myself, believe it or not, I'm telling him, even though he's a male, that your, your needs don't matter. You got to cater to everybody else. That's not true. Mm -hmm. So we actually have to do that, right? Tammy, please. Thank you very much for this. I'm, I've, I've gotten a lot of out of your, your talk. Thank you very much for, for presenting this. I'm I'm at the I'm up at a precipice. So I've I've been corporate for all of my adult life, and over the last three or four years, I've opened up my own business and am am constantly iterating that business. Um, whether I'm right to iterate it or not, I don't know. I had put myself out, and I was successful, and I was pretty good. But then I got paralyzed. And, and I'm kind of right now in that spot of where, okay, I did it, I know I'm good, but then I just flatline. Do you have any comments on how I can put, keep pushing myself? Yeah, I would say, what's the next thing? 
Like, what's the next thing, right? Because when you become comfortable, I, I, I have to confess, I, I have a couple of folks here at Smith who I'm pushing, who I don't need to leave, quite frankly, because if they left, I'd, be, I'd lose it. But I can see they're complacent. I can see they're not inspired. I can see they're actually getting bored, right? And the challenge with that, Tammy, is it's eroding your soul. It's eroding your essence. You're not living your full life. You're not. Because you know intuitively I could be doing more. And so I invite you, whatever it is that allows you to be introspective. For me, it's, it's long walks in the woods, walking along the lake, you know, going out on a kayak, whatever that is for you. It could be meditating. It could, whatever, that, whatever that space is for you where you go and your brain slows down and you allow yourself to be, to just be and ask yourself, what's next? What, what's, where are you feeling drawn to? It may surprise you. It may have nothing to do with your business and it may be another area of your life needs attention and you got to go lift that up, right? It's not always about this part of my life, because we're multidimensional human beings, right? It may be another part of your life that's pulling you, right? Um, and then for me, it's always been about what's next, yeah. right? What's next? Because often what's next is scary. And that's when my inner critic comes like, I don't know why you think you would be good at that, right? And that's when I'm like, well, you're probably right. I'm, I'm good here. This is, hey, this is a great job. I'm successful, right? So push yourself. But I think we have to go to a space where we can just be and slow down and see what comes up. Yeah. You know, I always say, and you're absolutely right, uh, Wanda, is going to the source of what's causing that paralyzation of what you're going through is really, as Wanda says, going deeper and finding out what that source is that's creating that, that feel. I know between Josie and I, we, um, we always need that challenge. That's part of our personality. So we embrace what needs to be embraced. And, and uh, so that keeps us going as well. And overcoming uh, definitely a lot of courage and overcoming that fear is, a, is an everyday thing. And it builds uh, a strong personality of confidence. And you will fail. One fails, you just pick yourself up and keep going. As Wanda says, do it anyway, just keep going. Uh, you learn and grow from it. So I hope that's helped in some way. Yeah, Gabby, I would say one thing, and then I'm going to go to Joanne and Jody. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is, folks, I think we need to spend more time talking about our failures because mm -hmm. people look at us as successful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, the number of times I have failed, the number of times I made bad decisions, the key is have you learned from them? Exactly. Or do you keep making the same mistake over and over and over and over again? But I think we need to do a better job of talking about our failures because no one is successful without failure. The only difference is there's a song I listen to regularly that says, we fall down, but we get up. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's not the falling down. It's the getting back up every time. And for all you know, the next time you get up, that's, that's the flywheel moment where it changes, right? But we shouldn't expect no hurdles, no challenges. We shouldn't expect to be perfect. And we should talk more openly about our failures because they help other people know that there's no perfect person. No one got to where they are without failure. Impossible. Well, heck, I, I just talked to my students about, uh, I've been fired. Yeah, I've been fired. People are like, really? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, They were wrong, but oh, whatever. Oh, well, I got fired. I got a better job, though. And I actually think it was the universe telling me to get out of that company. But I was so comfortable. I was so in my comfort zone that I didn't see it. And when they fired me, I literally, I'm not lying to you, within three weeks, I had a job that was equal to the boss who fired me. And it was a $20,000 increase in pay. And they fired me. I was like, thank you. 
<laughs> but I would have never thought to be really? looking outside this company, right? And who's lost ultimately was it? The companies. Absolutely. Right? But yes. I wouldn't have looked if they had fired me because I was in my comfort zone. Yeah. Literally. Joanne, yeah. please. Now, for me, I would hazard to say in your uh, discomfort zone, in addition to saying yes to opportunities, I'm having a harder time saying no to the old because I'm a trained accountant, but it took me years, like a decade to get out of accounting because I had no other experience, you know, so I've worked at a call center, which is what I want to do. And I just discovered how to communicate that this Thursday at the job event. But I mean, you know, it's working with the public, I want that instant connection. However, part of me also is taking the business side, like I have been on a board of directors, and I want to have that impactful, um, you know, environment. But as I I'm narrowing as I uh, figure out my true desires, I'm narrowing that field. And so I have to be careful not to like, you know, be everything to everyone. And so I land myself once again in an unfulfilling unfil position, mm -hmm. yet at the same time, in reality, I do need to earn a living at some point in time. So, I mean, how long do I hold out? Do I you know, look for those opportunities for the greater impact through, you know, volunteer or start, you know, I've applied to one w position that would be more of a greater impact, but I'd be totally satisfied dealing with the public. So I would say, Joan, look at it differently, right? I don't ever look at these as either ors, right? So I would say, first of all, thank God we have accountants who actually want to engage with humanity. This is good, right? Um, but I would say, how do you leverage those skill sets in a different way? Those skill sets are valuable in a lot of ways in a lot of organizations that wouldn't normally you wouldn't be thinking about. So sometimes I think it's important to sit down, even if it's just with a friend, a colleague, uh, a coach, and say to someone, here are the kinds of things I've been doing. And they will say to you, well, if you know how to do this, you could do this job. I think sometimes we forget about transferable skills and competencies. And we, we do exactly what you said, narrow ourselves down into the kind of role we can play as opposed to blowing ourselves up and saying, these skills can be used in a variety of ways, right? And don't under, I would say, as you're pursuing, while certainly there are times when you may decide um, the financial rewards are less important, I think women have to be careful with that because we deserve to be paid what we're worth. There's still a significant pay gap. Mm -hmm. And it's all because we don't know our worth. And I think it's worth you spending some time to document all the skills and competencies you have related to being an accountant and then saying, how would those skills look in different places? And even um, I, I always say to myself and others, don't lock in on a job title or a position, pay more attention to what's the role and how you would add value and how you would leverage the skills and competencies and experiences you have in new and different ways, right? Um, as the Dean at Smith, I can tell you, I use every single day things I learned as a military leader of troops in Germany, things I learned as a leader in business and things I've learned as leaders in academe. All of it every day. And it allows me to be successful in a unique way that other deans couldn't do because they wouldn't have those experiences and those those perspectives, right? So I would I would challenge you to, to have an, a broader view of how your skills, competencies, and experiences can be reimagined in a role that you may not be thinking about. Thank you. My pleasure, Jody. Last questions because we're at uh, we're at eleven. Okay, I'll be quick. Anyway, it's nice to finally actually meet you. We've been in lots of meetings together, but we've never actually met. 
Um, so my question is, when you are finding yourself moving out of your comfort zone into discomfort, if that forces the people around you to also go into their discomfort zone, um, what experience have you had with that? And how do you help like your team even in a transition mode? Because, you know, at Queen's, we have a lot of people who've done things the same a lot of the long time. It's time to make some change. So it, I think it's up to sometimes us Albertans to help <laughs> help them do that. So anyway, just some comments on that if you have them. Yes, absolutely. Yes, that's what's going to happen. If you're the leader and you are quite comfortable doing things you don't fully have 100% the answer to, it's going to freak out your team. It is. I tell them that in advance. I do. I preemptive strike, right? Uh, Jess knows. Jess happens to work in Smith, uh, and she's been as part of the leadership team now. I'm regularly saying, I don't got this answer, folks, so uh, how are we going to fix it? <laughs> right? um, or they'll say, because we're very successful, well, this is this time to say, well, just because we've been successful at it doesn't actually mean that's the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. And then they don't have an answer for that. Or if I say, okay, so just help me understand this process, right? And inevitably, while they're trying to explain it to me, they have this aha moment of, fudge, this makes no sense. Right. Um, and this just happened to me recently where there's a particular component of Smith that has been driving me crazy since the day I arrived. I asked someone to map it out for me on a whiteboard. And as they started doing it, I started asking questions like, you're right, this doesn't really make any sense. Ding, ding, ding. And now someone has come back to me and said, OK, maybe this works. And I'm like, oh, that's better. But I just presented it to the academic leadership team and they shot all kinds of holes in like, OK, in theory, we're on the right track. But we still got to fix this. I'm like, OK, go fix it. So now they're outside their comfort zone fixing the issue is not for me. I just set it up so that they're comfortable knowing I'm not going to beat you up if you come up with a solution that doesn't work. I'm not going to beat you up because I'm always saying, well, let's try. Jess will tell you my favorite word. Pilot. We're just going to pilot that. It's not in stone. And of course, if it works, it's not a pilot anymore. We're going to do it, right? But if you frame, particularly in post-secondary, if you frame things like, we're just going to try this out and see what happens, right? Can we pilot this for like a month or two? And then they'll start fixing it because they're like, well, that's not working. So you'll start uncovering all kinds of things, but they're fixing it. And then after it's like, dude, you guys rock. Awesome. That's our new plan. That's our new process. Good job. And you're like, I didn't do that. Y'all did that they're less likely to say no to that because they built it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and then I would say, Joe, the other thing is find support on campus. There are lots of us this way, right? Because you need to be, I talked to someone late last night on campus who was very frustrated. And I'm like, girl, you got this, come on. We're in this together. We have to do this work so that Queens can evolve. We have to. Yeah, it's the, it's the cross unit piece that can be the most challenging as opposed of course. to team piece because you're working with units that don't report to you so you don't have yeah but you but here's what's important it's influence you influence yeah. them so you have to remember that right yeah. and you're just trying you, you're just trying new things out like okay 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 could we try this even just see what happens right and if you start with, here's what the potential upswing is almost always, it's amazing. So can we at least see if this can work as opposed to like, oh, we've never done it that way before. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know, right? Um, and then sometimes you, uh, <laughs> what will happen, Jody? the more you do this, even if everybody doesn't get right on board, here's what's gonna happen for you is your direct reports will start doing this. Right. They'll start talking to other people like, well, I think we need to do this. And, you know, my leader wants us to do these kinds of things and they'll get a lot of pushback. Right. And here's my favorite feedback to my colleagues. Just ask them if they'd rather have that conversation with the dean. Because I have a reputation on campus already and people are like, no, I really don't want to have her explain why we have to do that. So I'm going to honor what you want to do. So I'd rather have to at least work with you because your dean is a little crazy. <laughs> so if ever I'm having an issue, I'll say, just talk to Wanda. <laughs> You'd be amazed how that's working. I got to tell you, the number of my colleagues who are like, I got to tell you, Wanda, I shouldn't have done it, but I dropped your name and it worked. I'm like, okay. That's wonderful. Love it. 
Well, thank, thank you everyone. I'm so grateful for this opportunity. Wow. I hope that has been at least something, some nugget that uh, helps you today, inspires you today. But you need to know that you are amazing. You are enough. And we're just delighted that you're doing what you're doing. Thank you. Wanda, thank you. Thank you. I remember when we met first back a year ago in May at Women of Inspiration luncheon at the chamber at the Holiday Inn. And I heard you speak and I said to Josie, we need to connect. <laughs> We are delighted that you are here in Kingston and all that you're doing at Queen's University and for the community. And thank you for your time, your many nuggets, the inspiration to be empowered uh, as women to move forward and do it anyway. Absolutely. We so believe in that and we can't thank you enough. And thank you to all of you for joining us this morning, giving us your time. And um, we wish you a good remaining week. And as I said, this is, has been recorded and we will be sending it through because sometimes it's nice to go back and to re-listen mm -hmm. and make and build on the nuggets that we heard today. Thank you all. Have a great remaining week. And thank you again, Wanda. All the best. All the best to all of you. Thank, thank you, you all. Have a great week. Thanks, Wanda.